Now I have a green plant with me and uh, as our scientific understanding has increased over the years, we know several things about this particular plant. Now I know that this plant is green in color because it absorbs every single color from the visible spectrum of light inside and reflects or transmits only the green part of the spectrum. Which means all the other colors are being utilized for some particular process. And we know that that particular process is a part of photosynthesis. And what is photosynthesis? That understanding is what we are going to find out in this particular class. Now, coming back to this plant, what else do I know about this plant and my own relationship to this plant? I know that I breathe in oxygen and I breathe out carbon dioxide. And I also know that this particular plant breathes in that carbon dioxide, uses it somehow and gives out oxygen which I can take in. And that is the unique relationship we share in nature between plants and animals. But how do plants utilize this particular carbon dioxide, light and water to produce energy for its own growth? That is what we are going to understand. But all of this understanding about myself or in particular about the processes that are happening in this plant called photosynthesis did not just come bursting out in one single day. It is the result of several experiments done by brilliant scientists like you. Yes, that is the result of several interesting experiments having been done. Now you are quite familiar with a few experiments already. Some of those experiments involve uh, uh, the variegated leaf experiment where you cover a part of the leaf with a black paper and you keep it out in the sun for some time and you bring it back in and you take that leaf, test it for starch and you will find out that you get starch in the places where you have not covered the leaves and you do not get starch positive results for the parts where you have covered the leaves. Now that is one experiment which tells you that light somehow plays an important role in photosynthesis. Now that is one. Another experiment is where you can take a plant a leaf and put one leaf inside a tube containing potassium hydroxide and the other leaf you leave it as such. Now what will happen, you leave it out in the sun and after some time you break it in, test the leaves for starch. In this experiment we expose the entire plant to the sunlight but that experiment tells us that carbon dioxide was somehow inhibited in the leaf which was dipped in potassium hydroxide, which absorbs the carbon dioxide by the way. So, that experiment tells us that carbon dioxide is essential for photosynthesis. So, in the one experiment we learned that light is essential for photosynthesis. In the other experiment we learned that carbon dioxide is essential for photosynthesis. And both these experiments we are testing for starch, which is the food product of the plant which helps it to grow into this very nice, lovely looking plant. Now I will keep this plant aside and explain to you some of the other similar experiments which we have done to prove the various factors responsible for photosynthesis or some of the early experiments which we have done and those experiments are the ones which have led to our understanding of how photosynthesis really works. Okay. In the year 1770, one of the earliest experiments which started the pavement road for photosynthesis was done by a scientist called Joseph Priestley. Now Priestley's experiments involved studying the role of air in sustaining life. What he did initially was he took a, took a mouse and he took a candle. He lit the candle and he placed both the mouse and the lit candle inside a big bell jar. The bell jar is a very big glass jar and there is absolutely no opening anywhere else. The bottom is closed and that's it. It's an isolated system. After some time, he found that the candle was extinguished and shortly thereafter, the mouse also suffocated and died. Now, why was this mouse sacrificed? Priestley summarized that somehow the air was being poisoned by either the mouse or the candle 
and he conducted another series of experiments where along with the mouse and the lit candle he placed the mint plant. What happened was very interesting. In this experiment, the mouse did not die and the candle remained lit. Now how did this happen? Well, what Priestley said was, at that particular time when Priestley was doing this experiment, he did not know that there was oxygen, there was carbon dioxide, we know all that today. But during that ancient time, they did not know, they only knew it as air. And uh, Priestley summarized that somehow the presence of the plant, the plant, was somehow purifying the damage done to the air by the mouse and the candle. And uh, today we know what is really happening in that particular experiment. Today we can understand that the plant has actually removed the carbon dioxide exhaled by the mouse and given out oxygen which was consumed by the candle. And so the candle was lit and the mouse was alive. And we can understand that today. We can understand the exchange of gases that were probably taking place inside the bell jar experiment done by Priestley. But that was what Priestley told at that particular time. After a few years, another scientist by the name of Jan Indenhaus did similar experiments to Priestley's, but he did that to prove that Priestley's experiments worked only under light. And what he did was, he did a similar experiment but with a very different experimental setup and he did that with aquatic plants. And uh, in that particular experiment, what Jan did was, he found out that this particular experiment did not work in the dark. And in the light, there was the presence of small bubbles on the surface of the leaves. And those gas bubbles were studied and found out to be oxygen molecules. And he found out that only the green parts of the plant were releasing these oxygen bubbles. And that happened only during the data. And this was an interesting revelation for us. After Jan Ingenhaus' experiment, another series of experiments after several years was done by another scientist. Along with Priestley and Jean, another scientist much later in 1854 by the name Julius Munchat. And this scientist, what he did was he actually identified that glucose was being produced as starch in the green parts of the plant. And uh, he did this experiment in a very, very different way. What he did was he took a plant and placed it in the light and he took another plant and placed it in the dark condition and he took the leaves from both the plants, he bleached them and then he treated with them with iodine. And when he treated them with iodine, if they have starch, the leaf would have turned to black. And if there was no starch, then the leaf remains white. And this happened, the positive result showing the presence of starch happened in the plants which were exposed to sunlight. And this led to the conclusion that somehow the green parts of the plants were responsible for storing glucose. Much later, okay, much later, a scientist by the name of T. W. Engelman did a few interesting experiments. Now, what he did was very, very interesting, and it also tells you what I told you in the beginning of the class about the plant being green absorbing all the colors of the spectrum and reflecting out green. Okay? What he did was he took a microscopic slide, a slide which he mounted on a microscope, he took a glass slide and he placed a thin strip of an algae. An algae is a microscopic plant. We know that that algae does photosynthesis. In that he introduced a culture of aerobic bacteria, bacteria which need oxygen to survive or rather bacteria which need air to survive. Okay, so that was the environment. Now what he did was very very interesting. Instead of giving light, what he did was he split the light into its individual spectra all across the slide using the prism. 
you know that when white light passes through a prism, it comes out as its individual spectral colors. And he made these spectral colors fall on different sides of the slide. Now what happened was fantastic. Because of photosynthesis, we know that the uh, photosynthetic areas in different sides of the spectrum are different. And uh, most of the bacteria needed oxygen to survive and the end product of photosynthesis was oxygen. So the aerobic bacteria started moving towards those areas where photosynthesis was highest. And they moved towards the blue and the red parts of the spectrum. And this was very, very interesting. And this experiment particularly proved which spectra of light were responsible for photosynthesis to occur or what were the spectral colors that determined the rate of photosynthesis. And this changed our fundamental understanding of photosynthesis. So let me revise everything once again. Okay? The first experiment was Priestley's experiment where he told about the importance of air in sustaining life and the purpose or the role of a plant in photosynthesis and how it gives out oxygen. In the second experiment, Jean Ingenhaus, he proved that light is necessary for Priestley's experiment to work. In the next series of experiments, particularly the experiment by Julius, what he identified was there were these starch grains inside the green parts of the plant which were somehow responsible for glucose production. Now glucose is a monosaccharide and starch is a polysaccharide and starch is the food product that the plant uses for its growth. And the experiments much further by T.W. Engelman proved that particular spectra of the light were responsible for enhanced photosynthesis. Now there was one more experiment. Much later in 1931, a scientist by the name of Cornelius von Neen did uh, a few experiments which told us that water was very very essential to photosynthesis. And it was in fact water molecules or hydrogen molecules which were getting oxidized and getting converted to this oxygen which was released by photosynthesis. And this experiment proved that how oxygen was being released or from where oxygen was being sourced. Because in the earlier experiment by T.W. Engelman, we knew that oxygen was being released and the bacteria were attracted to those particular zones. But Cornelius experiment, which was an early experiment in 1931, showed us that this particular oxygen was released by the water that we give or we pour to the plant. Okay. So photosynthesis involves what all? Photosynthesis involves light from the sun and it's not just any other light. It is the blue and the red spectra of the visible spectrum. There are a few spectra from the visible light that are particularly responsible for enhanced rates of photosynthesis. And then we also know now that from the early experiments it was also determined that photosynthesis occurred in the presence of light, it happened in the green parts of the plant, it happened inside the green plants of the plant in specialized structures which were known at that time as starch grains and they resulted in the formation of glucose which was a sugar that glucose led to starch all these things were found out in the earlier experiments and then Cornelius experiment showed that water is also involved so water, carbon dioxide, light all these things are responsible for photosynthesis and this was discovered and that is why these early experiments are very important for you to learn and understand. Right, now from all of those early experiments which we have done, we can now come to the summarized proper equation, chemical equation for photosynthesis. So we know that carbon dioxide is important, so 6 CO2 and we know that water is important from the experiments of uh, Cornelius uh, one meal. So 6 CO2 plus 12 H2O. H2O is for water, CO2 is for carbon dioxide in the presence of light. Okay, this was also proved by earlier experiments. So 6 CO2 plus 12 H2O in the presence of sunlight will give you C6H12O6 which is glucose. And it also results in water molecules, 6 water molecules 
and the six oxygen molecule. And oxygen is what we breathe in from plants after photosynthesis. So I will repeat the equation once again. 6 CO2 plus 12 H2O in the presence of sunlight will give you C6 H12O6 which is glucose plus 6 what? Yes, 6 H2O and 6 oxygen, right? So that is the complete equation.